the title alludes to uh, my uh, infatuation with the philosophy of Husserl, the European philosopher, and uh, his uh, phenomenology. And some decades ago, I um, developed an interest in this theme, but I had never the time to develop it. And still, I don't have the time to develop it. <laughs> uh, this is why I call it polygomena. Um, but I think, nevertheless, it will be of some interest. And uh, the question I'm going to ask, I claim, um, has not been addressed yet uh, in the uh, literature on Jainism, but I'm happy to be corrected on this point, and I would actually be delighted, because then that would um, save me a lot of work to look at these things. So it can be very quick. I mean, there are some uh, sources which uh, everyone knows here in this room which uh, are uh, discussing these things, uh, time, conceptions, and so on. Um, a few studies which I will refer to in the brief time remaining are these. Uh, the latest one by uh, Christoph Emmerich in the volume edited by um, Piotr, the latest one that I considered. And Emmerich there says, uh, so far, uh, research concerning time has concentrated on a rather late phase without considering earlier developments, i.e. late phase means classical Jainism, and he focuses on earlier um, uh, conceptual developments. The terminology, he says, in all of Jain literature on time nevertheless acquires not the strict strictness of the Buddhist works. And therefore, he refrains from constructing a coherent theory of time, that means reconstructing it, and rather um, focuses on some strategies of explanation and varying degrees of integration. And basically, the impression one gets is that, uh, according to this latest research on this issue, that uh, the Jain conception of time is not uh, very well developed. It is uh, a multiplicity of views which are not uh, well integrated and therefore one has to look at each and every single view and it is in a way a side issue of the Jain uh, philosophy. Now my paper will argue uh, somewhat differently that first the conception of time is fundamental to Jain soteriology and philosophy, both early and late. Theories of action, for instance, in time, we heard about uh, problems of causation, etc. And it would be interesting to hear Johannes' uh, views on uh, uh, the implications of time for the uh, theories on causation in Indian philosophy. But of course, also for philosophical perspectivism, Adikanta Vada, time is of the essence. Second point to be made, without systematization of the concept of time, classical Jainism, and I focus on that, could not have been established as a recognizable philosophical school. Third point, problems in the philosophy of time inevitably affect Jaina logic. And lastly, the logical reconstruction of the constitution of Jaina concepts of time as objects of time consciousness could be the theme of a new research program. I mean, I cannot solve things here. I ask some questions. Um, I give five examples first before I say something about the concept of time and probably run out of time by then. Um, example one, and I take this from Himal Trika's uh, work, which I am very impressed by, and I can say that he will arrive at about lunchtime. He has caught a plane. This is the latest news, so we can all inquire uh, personally later. He uh, points out that in the Sapta Bangi, on which we will hear many papers uh, today, um, an object is looked at at a variety of perspectives, but also, by implication, the uh, perspectives that are not mentioned 
uh, are implied. So the distinction between Svaparyaya and Paraparyaya is very important. And I think his work uh, is one of the few commentators, commentary works, which uh, focus on this aspect. And uh, he mentions, as I highlighted there, that the two aspects can only be sequentially expressed. And this is, of course, a general point that can be made about uh, perspectivism. Each perspective, from the conventional point of view of, of a mortal human being with, with, that is not omniscient, has to be taken one at a time. Of course, that leads to a potentially infinite uh, amount of time, and we have no time. So uh, how can we solve this? Is this just a heuristic, uh, the perspectivism? And if one looks at European ph philosophy, Husserl, etc., object constitution, one finds similar uh, problems, and that is quite interesting to explore <laughs> from a comparative point of view. But the point is, there's no, uh, in a way, Jane philosophy perspectivism shifts the problem from logic, you know, I agree with Piotr, uh, this is all more about ontology than inference and logic, but uh, it shifts the problem to the question of time, kicking it into the long grass, as the English say. Second example, Pramana and Naya, again from uh, Himaltrika. Method of Naya can only be subsequent to the method of Pramana. And the previous paper was addressing uh, issues like that. Again, this was highlighted by him. Again, the problem of time is flagged up. Example three, Vyavahara and Nishchaya Naya. The alternation of perspectives can also be only performed in time. And uh, Bansida Bhatt and Shalini Sinha have started to investigate how the perspective, which perspective was behind uh, a particular verse in the Samaya Sara, uh, for instance, but research is going on. These are many controversies. Example four, I will linger a little bit longer on that. I've written a bit in a paper on sacred matter in, in the Journal of Indian Philosophy on uh, uh, Dvaikriya, Ninava, and uh, Trivashika, Ninava, but Piotr also addressed this issue. And uh, today I look at this problem. Um, the Ninavas say these are heretics and they are uh, uh, rebutted by some uh, uh, implicitly uh, proposed orthodox Jain position. And uh, I would argue, and I have done so in Lumbini in the paper a, a month ago, that all the Ninavas deal with problems of part-whole relationships and uh, also, uh, uh, the relationship of um, uh, part-whole relationships in terms of time moments, the integration of a time moment and a, a, a time whole, as it were. Um, the Dry Kriya doctrine is associated with the story of Arya Ganga and Arya uh, Danagiri, his uh, teacher, and is well known, I don't, to most of uh, you here, uh, while crossing the waters uh, to meet his guru, uh, Ganga um, experienced the cold water and the hot sun at the same time. And he said, the Jain doctrine propounded in the uh, scriptures um, must be wrong because he has this experience. The Jain doctrine is that each perception can uh, be cognized only at a particular moment. And his uh, teacher then replies, rebuts him and says, uh, your perception is wrong. It, it, cre it creates an illusion. It's based on an illusion. Because you're not able to perceive that your perception actually is based on a very fast alternation of the two perceptions. They do not occur at simultaneously, but you're switching. Your mind is switching very, very quickly, imperceptible to the common mind between one and the others. So again, the problem is kicked into uh, the question of time. Um, and uh, that is a, a very interesting example, which I uh, have to skip because of the... 
So uh, this is the, uh, the verse cited. This is in the Vishesh Avashika Tika of Mal <coughs> Malayagiri. Uh, the non-production of many cognitions at one time is the essential quality of mind. This is cited as the key Jain tenet, which the heretics, such as, uh, in this case, Ganga, uh, do not accept. So if this is the key of Jainism, then, of course, we need to know more about time. And, uh, and the cognition of time, and this is where time consciousness and the phenomenology of time consciousness comes in. Um, you need an observer, and you need to theorize the role of, the, of an observer in uh, the uh, conceptualization of time, and there are many uh, uh, things to be said about that. Um, so uh, the Jains have made a, a number of propositions. Um, I am running quickly out of time. That's why I, I uh, summarize them uh, without giving you much evidence. Basically, uh, one argument is that there is a synthetic point of view, and uh, you know the seven nayas, and uh, uh, the samgraha point of view. From that point of view, you can take the whole in perspective without looking at the parts. For instance, you can look at a time sequence as a whole, you know, uh, as a picture, as it were. You see a line with dots and an arrow or whatever without looking at every instance. But from another perspective, from the real perspective, as it were, from the empirical perspective, you have to look at each instance. And, uh, well, but of course, we have to switch in time again from one perspective to the other to get the whole picture. So we have, again, the, the usual problem. And the ultimate solution is, of course, to posit some omniscient. I mean, this is a, a purely theoretical uh, fix, I think, um, because you have to take a leap of faith uh, to come from a uh, perspective, uh, from a conventional perspective, if you like, to a transcendental perspective, of the, to the determinate real perspective, Nishcha and Aya. Um, you cannot incrementally come from one to the other. And we discussed this problem in Lumbini as well. Um, so uh, I think the omniscient is just uh, posited and uh, attributed to uh, the mythical legendary story of Mahavira. We know Mahavira was a historical person, but not everything that was said about him was, is, is surely historical. So he was attributed with uh, uh, Kevala Jnana, etc., etc. And uh, that, I think, does not solve the problems of time. And uh, how much time do I have now here? Well, because we started at, uh, according to my watch, we started at 10:35 after the technical problems. Yes. So you have, uh, you have about uh, 15 minutes. Oh, you're very generous. That's good. <laughs> well, I mean that means we, we are yeah, getting late, good. but I mean it's okay. Um, well, let me go to this. Let me go straight to example five. This is the most interesting. Um, also well known, I'm not giving new data at all, I'm just pointing out, uh, I'm asking a question and pointing out directions which I think are worthwhile investigating. Um, in the mind of the omniscient, how do Kevala Dajna, absolute perception, and Kevala Jnana, absolute knowledge, relate to one another? It's a very famous controversy in uh, Jain literature. Um, and I give you uh, just a table. There are basically three positions. Uh, one is even the omniscient, although he knows everything or it knows everything, um, has to look at each and every cognition in a succession. This is position A. And interestingly enough, this is a position of the Jaina Agamas, the Shvetambra Agamas. I give you a few famous references there. And uh, Siddhasena Ghanin's commentary on the Tatvata Sutra, uh, uh, auto commentary of Umaswati, is also supporting this view, and Ijina Bhadra in the Vishesha Vashika Bhashya also. Uh, the opposite position is I mean, if these things are really relative to time, then there is, of course, 
the whole question of omniscience is put into question. And uh, some, uh, mainly Digambra, but not only Digambra philosophers, have said um, even uh, the omniscient must have uh, a simultaneous perception and knowledge of everything that there is. And uh, um, the idea is if all karmas are removed, there is no time uh, uh, consideration, but you, you see everything at once, and future and past, of course, and that is an interesting issue to consider uh, in terms of determinism. And there are so many issues that are worthwhile uh, developing, and I can, cannot show you all my, my own 250 slides. Uh, so uh, Kunda Kunda, and famously Umaswati, argues that point. Um, the third position is basically only uh, taken by Siddhasena Divakara, the most famous Shvetambara philosopher um, who uh, had his own mind and, and he argued that um, in the position B, perception and knowledge are still distinguished as two different cognitive functions, but they actually merge in uh, uh, the state of omniscience. There's no distinction anymore between perception and, and knowledge. The position B said, okay, there's still different qualities, but uh, that occur simultaneously, uh, but they remain different qualities. Siddha Sena says they basically merge into one. They're indistinct, and this is the Abhedavada position in contrast to the Sahavada and Kramavada uh, position. So it's a real problem for Jain philosophers, particularly the Gambra philosophers. This is at the apex, as it were, of the whole uh, uh, edifice uh, of Jain philosophy. And there's no agreement. And I think quite rightly so. Because if one looks at uh, the problem of time, you see that uh, uh, there is no solution there. It is universally agreed that non-omniscient uh, observers can only perceive everything in succession. So there's no disagreement there, but with regard to the omniscient, we have these three options. But the arguments, of course, uh, are in favor of that. I skip all that stuff here, which is um, quite uh, well known, and move on to a few things about um, time. Uh, I thought uh, in my, my brief reading of the literature on uh, concepts of time in Indian philosophy, the, the brief work of Shaya, which has been uh, republished, I think, last year in, in Warsaw, um, is the most useful for the purpose of, of this talk. Um, he proposed a hypothetical uh, reconstruction of uh, the uh, development of concepts of time in Indian philosophy in general, so not looking at just one uh, school, but focusing on Buddhism. He says, first, the, the oldest layer posits substantial time uh, called Kalavada, um, i.e. A, a kind of a fluid or a, a quasi-material substance that pervades all space. And this, is, uh, this perception is apparently shared, according to him, uh, by all schools. And uh, it can only be inferred, it cannot be observed, and, and so on and so forth. This is a very rudimentary conception, of course, but we are familiar with this conception uh, from the Jain philosophy still. Uh, so they, they must have carried some baggage from the uh, very, very early times in India. The second and next phase uh, is the Trikalya Vada, the uh, uh, doctrine, i.e. the uh, view that there is a past, present, and future. And uh, um, that is an issue that is also reflected, of course, in Jain philosophy, in the famous definition, for instance, of uh, Umaswati of existence as origination and uh, duration and cessation. I mean, the, uh, is another level. And uh, finally, and of course, Shaya says the Buddhist position is the most important one, uh, the most advanced one 
Um, there is the, only the present is real, um, not uh, past, present, and future. I mean, these are all intellectual constructions, you know, what is past and what is future. Only the present can be experienced. And, and these are the basic, uh, um, uh, very broad alternatives in Indian philosophy. Um, the Jains are usually classified under uh, a realist, i.e. those who accept a substantive notion of time. But uh, for them, time is a substance, one of six substances, but a substance that has no mass. It is therefore not uh, seen as belonging to the astikayas. It's a, a massless uh, substance, and therefore it is special and not accepted by all Shvetambara thinkers as, as a proper substance, but uh, uh, basically most agree it is a substance, but a substance without mass. Uh, the Buddhists, are, of course, strictly, most of them, not all, some complexities, uh, non-realistic schools. And here are some characteristics of time as a substance, subtlety, omnipenetrability, omnipresence, eternity, unity, indivisibility, etc. And uh, that is an interesting observation of Shaya, I think, that time and space stand in the middle of a scale between spiritual and coarsely material substances. And that was the conclusion of my, uh, the paper in, in the Journal of Indian Philosophy, which I uh, worked on recently, that um, the, the space, the notion of space, akasha, and time is reduced in space, I can say that because of lack of time. It, Time is spatialized in, in the Jain conception, as in other conceptions, um, is in a way the, um, the third between jiva and ajiva, or the, the third element which anchors the whole uh, Jain cosmology, the whole Jain system. And Shaya's uh, observation here, I think, um, fits uh, this quite well, and or my little footnote uh, supports his perspective. And this is a very, very interesting um, thing. Um, now, what are the foundations of realist time theories? Uh, Shire says, and this can be all substantiated with slides which I have from Jane text. Number one, real time, color, must be postulated as a necessary correlate of time terms and time relations. Uh, this is exactly what Johannes Bronkos has said a, a minute ago in a different context. It simply has to be, there has to be something because what are our words otherwise referred to, you know? So um, it's a, a kind of uh, reification. The second uh, argument made in favor of substantial realist time series is um, the, uh, the observed changes and the impermanence of uh, existence and uh, uh, two causes are distinguished in the Jain literature as well. A specific cause of change, which one can observe, and a cause of change writ large with a big C, you know, change of everything, you know, the flow of time or something like that. And these, the second cause, of course, is, is inferred. It cannot be observed. It is inferred from the specific causes. Now I skip all this. These are uh, nine uh, categories of time. I now give you a few examples of Jain uh, notions of time and the multiplicity which uh, uh, Christoph Emmerich rightly uh, referred to. Um, of the nine mentioned in the Avashika Yukti, which may be the <laughs> oldest text, um, four are highlighted in the Vyapanati. And uh, basically, I think there is a, uh, an opposition between absolute time this is again, you know, time writ, writ large. And uh, number nine, uh, uh, the inner state is bhava, um, particular changes that are experienced. And in between, uh, um, there's some, uh, there's conventional time, large time measures like uh, eons, uh, usarpini, avasarpini, uh, and measured time, this is civic time. So uh, these conceptions are, in a way, objective uh, time conceptions. 
and the uh, italicized aspects could be linked to, uh, I mean, number nine as well, uh, to subjective uh, time conceptions. But I think, the, in general, the Jains cannot answer the question how time is experienced very well because they try to present an objective theory of time. And uh, in that sense, time consciousness, this whole issue, has to be inferred by a modern observer. Or uh, This is a theme that is brought from the outside to the tradition. But there are, of course, uh, texts which uh, explain how one perceives change and so on. That is very interesting. It needs to be studied. Um, now, uh, I'm running out of time, I suppose. Well, from, uh, from the point of view of measured time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me uh, come uh, finally to uh, give you some food for thought to uh, um, notes, uh, uh, some... Uh, to this and, and a final uh, citation from Nagin Shah, who wrote a very good article on this. Um, so there are different attributes of absolute time and, and conventional time. And the interesting thing is that Samaya, the instant, uh, comes up uh, twice. Uh, once as a, a, a time measure, or is it not in this? It's not here. Let me see. Is it in the other? Ah, oh, here. Um, no, I'm sorry. So many slides to show. Um, yes, Samaya comes up there as a heading, Samaya. And here, uh, so it's a modification of absolute time. And on the other hand, it's uh, a unit of conventional time that is theoretically positive. And according to the text, is the time an atom takes to move across a space point which it occupies. Uh, it's a slow movement. So that shows that there's a circular definition. Time is defined in terms of t time, the time an atom takes, etc. Similarly, there's a circular definition of space. And uh, um, these are problems which uh, uh, people like Nagin Shah, for instance, have addressed. Um, but you can see um, absolute time, substantivized time, kala, and conventional time, etc., have been completely uh, separated. And the re question is, how do both relate to one another? And that is an unsolved problem. Of course, these unsolved problems lead only to one conclusion. Jain philosophy, Jain logic, is not standing on sound foundations. Uh, the, basically, the work has to be done to explain these, uh, uh, I wouldn't say contradictions, these conundrums. And uh, well, this is for you to discuss. Uh, I will close uh, with these uh, quotations from Nagin Shah. Otherwise, you, the Jains in the audience accuse me for uh, <laughs> uh, not uh, representing the proper Jain point of view. Um, he points out that, according to Jain philosophy, every substance has qualities and modes. Therefore, it does not need time as an additional external substance that causes the modes. The modes are already attributes of the substance. And um, uh, in fact, I see no logic in positing time as an independent substance, he writes. We can account for all the concerned usages with the help of the modes of the five substances. Minute changes in the kala, the absolute time, are eternal without beginning and end. Hence, it is illogical to posit a causal condition to account for it. What is eternal, beginningless and endless, has no cause whatsoever. The description of time as atomic, these samaya atoms, seems metaphorical. Each and every material atom could be called time ap atom. And this very well explains the scriptural statement regarding the absence of its spatial extensions, i.e., time is not an astikaya. Why is it not conceived as one continuous whole like dharma 
our dharma and akasha. Time is posited to account for the minute changes in other substances. But what would account for the changes in the time substance itself? Well, the answer is time, and therefore the whole thing becomes circular. If it is be said that the modification of time atoms is natural and hence requires no other ca causal condition, the same logic could be applied to explain the modifications of other substances. If some other auxiliary cause is posited to explain changes in the time atom, it would involve infinite regress. Hence, this view of an independent time, at, at atomic time, substance seems to be very weak and unsound. Thank you very much. <laughs>